Bill Grumpy Jenkins rolls up to tech inspection with a white and red Chevrolet Vega that looks like nothing anyone has seen before. This was a full tube frame race car wrapped in Vega body panels, and it's about to make every other pro stock car obsolete. This is the shocking truth behind Grumpy's Toy 11, the car that was too advanced for its own good and changed pro stock racing forever. The dawn of Grumpy. Bill Jenkins didn't earn the nickname Grumpy for being cheerful. He first gained fame in the early 1,960 seconds, building winning Mopars, Junior Stalkers, and the old reliable Chevys for Dave Strickler. The old reliables dominated categories, from stock through factory experimental. In 1965, Bill climbed behind the wheel of a super stock Plymouth and took top stock at the NHRA Winter Nationals. The following season saw the debut of the first of 17 Grumpy's Toys Chevys. Bill's status as the man who couldn't be beaten grew with an NHRA Pro Stock World Championship win in 1972. That season, his revolutionary 331 C-powered Vega won six of seven NHRA national events entered. How popular was the one they called Grumpy? In 1973, Time magazine carried an article enlightening the outside world on the nation's highest paid sports figure. Time gave a brief history on Grumpy the Drag King and calculated that Bill was pulling in $5,650 per minute based on his earnings and time spent racing. But by 1974, Jenkins saw something everyone else missed. The future wasn't about more cubic inches, it was about total engineering dominance. Building the revolution, Grumpy's Toy 11 was by far the most innovative pro stalker to date. What made this car unique among pro stalkers of the day was its full tube chassis, McPherson strut rack and pinion front suspension, and dry sump oiling system. These innovations remain staples in the pro stock category to this day. Unlike Grumpy's previous two Vegas, Grumpy's Toy XI was a true full tube chassis car. Bent by SRD race cars, speed research and development, a spin-off of Jenkins competition to Bill's own specifications, the new chassis extended through the fabricated firewall, eliminating the last of the stock Vega underpinnings. The completed chassis weighed a shade more than 100 pounds, an engineering marvel of 4,130 chrome moly tubing that was TIG or Heliarc welded. The folks at Jenkins Competition designed the front suspension in conjunction with Dick Whitman at SRD and Roger Lamb of Lamb Components. Skipping through a magazine one evening, Bill's employee Ed Quee spotted an advertisement for a car that incorporated McPherson's strut suspension and thought it was exactly what they needed. We always had problems in the previous Vegas with the arm front suspension, trying to gain enough room for the headers to exit the head without a quick turn. Quay explained. The fabricated uprights were bolted to lamb-designed struts, which were loosely based on Datsun 240Z units but at approximately one-third of the weight. The strut dictated the general layout for geometry purposes, the spindle was at the strut centerline, and the upper strut mount was high. The struts bolted to the upper chassis tube that doubled as the engine plate mount. The struts were so high that the hood required notching for clearance, Finishing the suspension was a basic pinto rack, fabricated tubular lower control arms, and one 8-inch steel cables to limit suspension travel. The new chassis and strut suspension cut approximately 150 pounds off the car over the previous Vega. That wasn't just an advantage, it was revolutionary, the secret weapon. To compensate for driver weight, the 680 HP, 331 Lenco transmission and rear end were offset one inch to the passenger's side of the car. The Lenko carried a 2.95 first gear, while shortly into the season, the initial 12-bolt rear end gave way to a Dana unit that measured 40 inches across and usually housed 6.17 gears. Supporting the rear was Bill's own designed three-link rear suspension with 48 possible positioning points. The heart of Grumpy's Toy 11 was the 680 horsepower 331 CI small block. A pair of heavily modified Holly Dominator carburetors fed through an equally trick Edelbrock TR1X manifold. 
Compression was in the neighborhood of 15 to 1, insane numbers that demanded race fuel and razor-sharp tuning. Having a backdoor to General Motors, Bill was able to have the cores to the 292 turbo cylinder heads modified to his liking, sourcing E16 aluminum heads that breathed like nothing else in pro stock. The body in white was shipped to Aerochem and given a dip in their acid bath to remove excessive weight. Expandable foam was then used in strategic locations to give added support to the lightened body. Fiberglass bumpers, hood, and rear hatch were hung before Jack Trost laid on the GM ermine white paint with 1,950 to 1,960 Ford poppy red accents. Jim the painter laid on the stripes and lettering. Motor plates were fabricated for both small and big block engines, even though a big block was never installed. This wasn't just a modified Vegaite, was a complete reimagining of what a race car could be. Shocking the world. Bill debuted the Vega in March 1974 at Atco Raceway during a match race against the Cleveland-equipped Pinto of Gap and Roush. He defeated Wayne Gap three straight times, turning a best of 8.86 at 152 miles per hour. The performance was stunning, but the real statement was about to be made. With Chrysler's ongoing boycott of NHRA Pro Stock, due to what they felt were unfair weight breaks of 7 pounds CI, the category became a battle between Chevy, Ford, and AMC. The superior Cleveland-headed Fords, which were the odds-on favorites at any given event, ran the same 6.65 pounds CI as the small-block Chevrolet. For the third year running, Bill and his super crew won the NHRA Summer Nationals. With Larry Lombardo behind the wheel, the Vega defeated Scott Shafiroff, Bob Glidden, and Dave Canners in his AMC Hornet X before meeting Gap and Roush's new four-door Maverick in the final round. In what must have been one of the most satisfying races of his career, Larry strapped a whole-shot lead on Wayne that he just couldn't make up. The Vega tripped the lights with a 9.11 at 150 to Wayne's quicker, but losing 9.02 at 151.77. The domination begins. Top fuel racer Don Garlitz organized the third annual National Challenge Drag Race in 1974, and Bill, having won the previous two, attended with hopes of making it a three-peat. The Professional Racers Organization held that year's race at the New York Speedway the weekend before the NHRA Nationals. Although the $15,000 win money was down from the previous year, it was still close to double what NHRA was paying for a professional category win at the Nationals. In a blow-by-blow -blow dissection of the event, Superstock and Drag Illustrated reported that the race went down as one of the worst in history due to poor organization, an inadequate field of cars, poor weather, and lack of attendance. The Pro Stock field, which generally ran 32 cars, had to make do with 23 that showed up. All pro stockers ran at the same 6.75 pounds, CI, and even though one would think this favored Chrysler's Hemi cars, things played out differently. Bill qualified his Vega, a 10 second quicker than the fastest Hemi, a humiliating statement to the Mopar faithful. On Bill's march to another final round appearance, he put away Ronnie Sox, Don Carlton, and Gap and Roush. In the final, he showed the Hemis once and for all that his small block Vega could meet them head on by defeating Mike Fon's Motown missile Cuda. In winning the event, Bill banged off times of 8.81, 8.81, 8.79, 8.78, .8, and 8.8 .8 at speeds in excess of 155 miles per hour. The quickest class legal time turned in by the Vega in 1974 was an 8.74 at 154 miles per hour. Grumpy's Toy 11 became the only Chevrolet Pro Stock racer to win any NHRA events in 1974. The backlash. Competitors didn't just dislike Jenkins, they were furious. The Ford teams argued that if they'd been allowed to build full tube frame cars with radical suspension systems, they'd be unbeatable. The Mopar boycotters pointed to Grumpy's Toy 11 as proof that NHRA's rules favored Chevrolet. 
Even other Chevy racers muttered that Jenkins had gone too far, turning pro stock into an engineering competition rather than a driver's sport. But Jenkins wasn't apologizing. He had exploited every gray area in the rulebook without explicitly breaking any written rules. Was it fair? That depended on who you asked. But it was legal, and that's all that mattered. The final victory. Grumpy Jenkins collected his last national event win as a driver at the 1,975 NHRA Spring Nationals. He drove the Vega to an 8.98 at 152.28 to defeat Roy Hill's Duster, which turned in a 9.16 at 149. But looking to overcome the advantage of the Cleveland-powered Fords and the advantage his own innovations had created for competitors who'd copied them, Bill built himself a new pro stocker in mid-1975. Based on the aerodynamically superior Chevy Monza, the last race for the well-worn Vega was the 1,975 NHRA Summer Nationals, where team driver Larry Lombardo fell to Wayne Gap in the final round. Bill sold the Vega to Harold McCready immediately after the race. Harold removed the Grumpy's toy stickers and ran the car for the next few seasons, horsing around with a 302. The lasting impact. Glenn Sharp bought the Vega, performed a restoration, and sold Grumpy's Toy 11 in 2007 for a cool $525,000. The Vega was torn down once again and gone through thoroughly by Scott Hoare for owner Don Wallace. The car was authenticated by Jenkins in 1993, and he personally signed the deck lid. The restored car was unveiled at the 1,994 Winter Nationals, proving it could still run an 8.8 .8 .8 at 152 miles per hour. Today, the restored Vega has proven too valuable to race and only makes special appearances. The question that remains, was Grumpy's Toy Egg Lev a brilliant stroke of engineering genius or a cynical exploitation of rule loopholes? Did Jenkins save pro stock by forcing it to evolve? Or did he destroy what made it special by turning it into a pure engineering competition? The answer is probably both. Jenkins saw the future and built it before anyone else was ready. He pushed the boundaries of what was legal and what was fair, and he paid the price by becoming the villain of his own success story. The Vega that shocked the world proved that sometimes the best way to win isn't to follow the rules, it's to rewrite them entirely. And that's exactly what Grumpy Jenkins did, one perfectly engineered component at a time. What other controversial race cars changed motorsport forever? Let us know in the comments and check out our other videos about the innovators who dared to think differently.